This is Audible. Liminal Dreaming Exploring Consciousness at the Edges of Sleep by Jennifer Dimper. Narrated by Jennifer Dimper. Published by North Atlantic Books. The following information is intended for general information purposes only. Individuals should always see their health care provider before administering any suggestions made in this book. Any application of the material set forth in the following pages is at the reader's discretion and is his or her sole responsibility. Part 1. Meet Liminal Dreaming Chapter 1. Liminal Dreams, Liminal Mind, and an Oracle I've been lecturing and writing about dreams since the 1990s, but I only began focusing on liminal dreaming in the last six or seven years. Previously immersed in work with REM dreams, the kind of dreams we usually mean when we talk about dreams, I've taught people about onerogens, dream mapping, developing practices around dreams, and accessing imaginal interior worlds through dreams, all topics I address in part two of this book. I even published a version of the story I'm about to tell you with attention paid to different elements of it. Although I had experience with what I came to understand as liminal dreaming, I didn't have the language or understanding to talk about it. I have long known that different sleep stages produce different kinds of dreams, and that the dream states of hypnagogia and hypnopompia, which together make up liminal dreaming, exist at the boundaries of sleep and waking states. But like most people, I thought of them as way stations, forms of consciousness we pass through as we lie down to rest at night or first come to consciousness in the morning. I didn't think of them as places to stop and explore. But a series of experiences, beginning with the one I'm about to relate to you, brought liminal dreaming to the center of my attention. This story tells you a lot about liminal dreaming, what it is, why it interests me, and how I use it. It's also an origin story, the tale of an extraordinary experience that refocused my life. I also want this story to serve as inspiration for you to find interesting ways to work with your liminal dreams. As I say repeatedly, throughout this book and at every class or workshop I teach, I want you to learn to liminal dream and then do something with it. Make it your own. An Encounter with the Oracle at Delphi in September 2012, my spouse and I traveled to Greece. Pilgrimaging in a Prius, we meandered around the mainland in the Peloponnese and visited ancient and holy sites. This was a particularly meaningful journey for me. As a kid, I read the Greek myths over and over again. My sister and I sometimes acted them out. Both my undergraduate and my master's degrees involved studies of myth. Homer, Ovid, Sophocles, Euripides. I've always loved the immediacy of the relationships the ancient Greeks had with their gods, tragedy notwithstanding. I invoke some of these figures still. I also really wanted to visit Epidaurus, the center of the dream-healing cult of Asclepius. The origins of Western medicine lie in the temples of Asclepius, pilgrimage sites for ancient Greeks in need of healing who relied on the priests early doctors and dream workers. We visited the extraordinary Asclepion at Epidaurus, but my mind-blowing dream experience happened in Delphi. As you may know, Delphi housed the Pythia, the famous oracle at Delphi. This priestess, or Sibyl, served as mouthpiece for the god Apollo. He spoke through her and offered wisdom and prophecy. During the classical period, the era that produced most of the philosophy, culture, and art that we think of when someone talks about ancient Greece, the Pythia exerted enormous influence at the highest echelons of power. 
The men who ran the ancient world consulted her before they started wars, established colonies, or arranged their marriages. Nobody knows exactly how the oracle did her thing. Popular theories claim she uttered howling gibberish, high on the fumes of a gaseous vent, and that the priests of Apollo then translated these ravings into prophecy. Others believe she spoke rationally and delivered her prophecies in a normal voice. It's not difficult to imagine that history might morph the image of a woman who held real power into a raving druggie who only made sense after some mansplaining from the priests of the god of reason. It also seems that over the hundreds of years that a sibyl served as oracle, her position and methods changed. Though little is known about the oracular sessions themselves, the Pythia shows up all over the literature of the time, from Plutarch to the plays. As the voice of Apollo, she perfectly embodies the direct contact the Greeks had with their gods. Early in the day, on the long road to Delphi, Eric, my spouse, turned off the main road on a whim to see a remote prehistoric cave dwelling at the top of a steep craggy hill. As we rounded a curve of the winding switchback road, I saw something move in the distance. At first, I thought it was a cat or a goat, but it didn't move quite right for that. As we got closer, I made out the flapping of wings. Then it took off, and we both realized what we were seeing. A massive, white-tailed eagle with about an eight-foot wingspan gripping an equally impressive snake in its talons. No doubt to avoid us, the bird took off, doing its best to keep control of the twisting, thrashing serpent. It managed to hold on, but the snake's substantial size kept the eagle weighted low to the ground. After we followed the pair from our car for a spell, the eagle, still engaged in the struggle, flapped downhill and disappeared behind a row of bushes. How's that for a symbolically rich vision? We arrived in Delphi a few hours later. The setting is visually stunning. Look uphill from the edge of town and you'll see the sanctuary sprawling across the mountainside. Even from a distance, the size of the grounds is impressive. It takes a long time for the eye to travel over the extent of it. Ruins of temples and treasuries, toppled statues and stoas, curved paths that navigate through massive marble blocks. It goes on and on. Downhill, a vast panorama unfolds. A wide, ancient riverbed stretches for miles in either direction mostly dried enough to become land, transformed into fertile, lush terrain. In the distance, the massive mouth of the river pours into the Gulf of Corinth, glittering pale blue. We eyed the ancient site of the oracle with longing in the early evening light, but we'd planned to stay in town two nights to allow ourselves an entire day to explore the museum and sanctuary. We really wanted to save it. So, instead of climbing up toward the entrance, we decided to take a stroll along the road to enjoy the beauty of the place as the oncoming sunset spread its hazy light across our view. This turned out to be an excellent choice. As the temperature cooled and the misty air became tinted with rose and gold, we came upon a surprise. A smaller but still sizable temple complex located about half a mile away from the main site. Puzzled, we climbed down the stone steps into the enclosure, apparently free to the public, and started to poke around. We'd stumbled onto the sanctuary of Athena Prone. It turns out that during the Neolithic period, the place where we now stood was a center of earth goddess worship that makes it likely to have predated the Pythias temple up the hill. Eventually, the Greek gods moved in, Apollo got his big sanctuary, and the shrine we discovered, now dedicated to Athena, became the place where pilgrims stopped on the way to consult the oracle. 
Prone means before the temple. Completely by accident, we'd found ourselves following the path pilgrims traditionally walked to approach Apollo's temple and consult the Sibyl. The posted signs that provided this information also said that on the road back toward town, further along the ancient route, we would encounter the remains of an ancient spring where supplicants stopped to cleanse and purify themselves before their sacred encounter with the oracle. And as we walked back, there it was, or some version of it, anyway. Purification. The physical cleansing of the body implies clearing of the mind, the preparation for a numinous encounter. I stepped up to where a gush of water poured from rock and cupped my hands to catch the stream. The water flowed into the bowl formed by my palms and fingers, cool and clear, then ran out over the sides. For a long time, I stood still, concentrating on the feeling, this possibly ancient flow of water pooling briefly in the vessel formed by my cupped hands, and then pouring out again. It brought to mind the flow of time pooling in my body, which soon, too, would pour out, leaving me in the wake of history. I was yet another pilgrim headed to the Temple of Apollo, reproducing the movements of so many who had come before me, as others would after me. For that moment, I felt connected to the scores of beings who had consulted the oracle. I considered what I wanted to ask the Pythia, and so I closed my eyes and I asked for a dream. My question, how do I meet the mythic and integrate it into my life? In other words, how could I meet the oracle at Delphi thousands of years after the last Pythia disappeared? A dead woman cannot answer questions. Then again, I didn't exactly want to query a specific woman. The oracle was, at any given time, a single person. But the succession of individuals over hundreds of years also get lumped together and called the oracle. Even for the ancients, the oracle was as much an idea as she was an actual person. I can't encounter the Sibyl as an individual woman, but the mythic idea of her remains in my mind. I can meet that. And, as Aristotle says, as you'll hear later in the book, if it's in memory and imagination, it can feed your dreams. The ideas in this book fit together more like a hologram than like an Aristotelian arc, that narrative structure they teach you in high school where there's a clear beginning, middle, and end to a story. When you hear Chapter 6 on dream perception, focused on Jungian and Sufi ideas about the imagination, you'll know that some traditions that heavily integrate dream work also rest on the idea that the imagination is a faculty of perception or understanding. In fact, I'll return to that idea repeatedly throughout this book. Imagine two realities superimposed, actual Delphi with its tumbled Doric columns and the Delphi of imagination, of historical memory and sacred possibility where priestesses can easily talk with gods. Awake, inhabiting the mode of consciousness required to write these words, I primarily inhabit the first world. But in dream worlds, I have a different kind of access. In liminal dream space, I can slip into the gap between the two Delphi's. In REM dream, I can even believe that I'm there and meet the ancient oracle herself. In chapter 11 on Onerogens, I talk about oneromancy, or divination through dreams. That night, the first of our two nights in Delphi, I had a REM dream of a card similar to a tarot card, an oracle card. The image on that card, a mostly black and white, heavily lined drawing of a woman, looked gothic. 
I may have been looking at a third-person view of myself, but it might not have been me. I wasn't sure. Her thick black hair blew behind her, and her red dress billowed dramatically in the wind. In her outstretched hands, she held a heart, simultaneously a romantic valentine and an anatomical heart. The card was called the heart. Morning revealed a blazing heat-blasted day. Even in my large floppy hat, I found the intensity of the sun overwhelming as we made our way to the site. Along the path that wound up the hill through the sanctuary, I found a shady spot nestled against a weathered, crumbling wall. I curled up on a huge block of marble, a chunk of some building once a part of the temple structure, and I settled in for a nap. I drifted into hypnagogia. I felt a gentle wind on my skin and heard the bird song and murmur of tourists that inhabited the here and now Delphi of the waking world. As I tuned in to the literal Delphi, I drifted into the Delphi of my imagination, the one I'd studied so much in my youth. I felt myself in both places simultaneously. Again, I asked the oracle for a dream. That night in my sleep, I was given directions. I was to make a second card to match the heart, the card I'd gotten in the first dream. This second card, I was given to understand, should contain the color electric blue. The name of this card was My Own Death. The dream also involved me giving a lecture on self-reflection or self-reflexivity. This seemed exactly like the kind of inscrutable utterances the oracle traditionally offered. Deciding how to decode the language and imagery had clearly become a task for me. Together, my two Delphi dreams offered several answers to my question about how to meet the mythic and integrate it into my life. Liminal dreaming has taught me to manifest liminal mind the ability to slip back and forth between this world of material reality and the otherworldly realm of dream and mythic space, with imagination as a faculty of perception that mediates between them. Skeptically-minded folks, those who tend more toward materialistic points of view, might scoff at the idea of an imaginal encounter with the oracle. To meet a literal sibyl entails believing in ghosts or gods, a silly prospect to the daylight mind. On the other end of the scale, the more reverent or religious among us might feel offended by my efforts to practice a tradition that isn't mine and that arguably died centuries ago. Those of a self-consciously spiritual or new age orientation might suggest any number of ways for me to meet the oracle. Someone could channel the sibyl for me. I could reach her via seance, or the crystal structures of the rocks in the area might enable me to talk with the spirits of the place. Dreams circumvent these arguments. Dreams do not require belief to bring about extraordinary experience. I'm not concerned with making any claims about whether my interaction was real or not. It doesn't contradict or confirm anyone else's belief. For me, the richness of the encounter lies within the realm of experience itself. I washed my hands with thoughts of purification. I followed a path that pilgrims walked for centuries. I had some cool dreams. My interaction with Delphi was powerful and memorable. For me, that's what matters. This artful life does not require belief or adherence to any set of ordained actions. It is a strange loop in which a creative approach to being in turn produces more and surprising opportunities for creativity and encounter. 
We all share the hunger for new experiences of consciousness, for visionary experience. Liminal dreaming offers many benefits, which I will enumerate in the pages to come. What is liminal dreaming? There's a swirling, kaleidoscopic, free associative experience on the edge of your mind. You'll find it in the space right between awake and asleep, where your meandering consciousness mixes memory and thought with visionary imagery. I call this experience liminal dreaming. Liminal refers to the spaces in between things, the transitional condition of thresholds or boundaries. There are two dream states that together make up liminal dreaming, hypnagogia and hypnopompia. These constantly morphing states cling to the edges of sleep. You're probably familiar with both, but you may never have given them much thought. As you slip into sleep at night or during naps or fatigued delirium, you pass through hypnagogia. Coined in 1848 by Louis Ferdinand Alfred Maury, a French scholar and physician whose ideas about the interpretation of dreams influenced Freud. The word hypnagogia comes from the Greek hypnos, meaning sleep, and agagos, leading, and conveys the meaning of leading into sleep. But you might first notice it when you're fighting to stay awake. In a darkened movie theater, in an overheated lecture hall, or alone on your couch late at night waiting up for someone to come home, you might experience hypnagogia as a kind of exhausted hallucination. As you slip into a nap, it might manifest in the form of vivid visions. When you drift off at night, perhaps you see eerie faces turning toward you, hear alien radio stations, or jolt out of the feeling of falling. When your arm or leg jerks involuntarily, you know you're experiencing hypnagogia. In the morning, you surface from sleep through the swimmy realm of hypnopompia, the twin of hypnagogia that emerges on the other end of sleep. This word, coined in 1897 by Frederick W. H. Myers, the founder of the Society for Psychical Research, also comes from the Greek hypnos, joined with pompe, or sending away. Lying warm and cozy in your bed as you slowly awake, you might notice that something that began as a thought has become a dream. Memory shifts into story as you realize your mind is sinking back into dozing or that you aren't actually as awake as you thought you were. Hypnagogia and hypnopompia provide some of the strangest, loveliest, and most interesting dreams. They're quite unlike what you experience during REM, rapid eye movement, the phase of dreaming you've probably heard of. Most people know that dreams happen during REM, but not many understand that dreams happen in other phases of sleep as well. Liminal dreaming is a remarkable mind state, one you can channel for creativity or problem solving, use as a form of metacognition to explore your thought processes, or simply play with as a form of consciousness exploration. I spent the last couple of years cultivating liminal dreaming, and now I can drop into it quite easily. But I've been teaching and writing about dreams since the 1990s. For almost 20 years, my work and attention focused on REM dreams. I played with lucid dreaming, explored commercially available EEG gadgets, and would sometimes wake up at five in the morning to take herbs that would lengthen my periods of REM. We'll explore some of these practices later. They're amazing, but they didn't prepare me for the series of bizarre and fascinating liminal dream experiences that completely changed the focus of my research. I first consciously decided to take up the practice of liminal dreaming one late December night. I'd already had my experience in Delphi. I also already knew that we have different kinds of dreams in different sleep stages, as I'll discuss in chapter three. But like most people, I still thought of dreams as REM dreams. Then I had a dream that really changed my mind. I had gone to bed fairly early, a thing I rarely do. In the winter, 
My feet get frigid and I don't sleep well. The night was particularly cold, so I put my pink rubber hot water bottle, which I call the pig, at the foot of the bed. Feeling heat on my feet as I snuggle down into chilly sheets is particularly soporific for me. It makes for good sleep. That night, I climbed into bed with the pig, sliding over as close as I could to my warm sleeping spouse without waking him. Before long, I became aware of the heaviness in my limbs and a slightly disconnected feeling between body and mind. To my surprise, I realized that my body had fallen asleep while my mind remained awake. I listened to the sound of my breathing, slower and deeper than usual, the unconscious, self-regulated sound of sleep. You know the sound of someone sleeping when you hear it. My mind whirred, still conscious, but right on the line of slumber. I knew that if I thought too hard or tried to stir even a little, my body would wake up. I also knew that if I relaxed a bit more and unfocused my thoughts, my mind would fall asleep. Amazingly, I managed to straddle the line and remain perfectly poised between waking and sleep. For the first time, I put forth the effort to linger at the edges of consciousness. Aware of myself lying in bed, listening to my breath and feeling my body begin to warm, I started to dream. I moved slowly down a hallway with a black and white checkerboard tile floor. The dream was both there and not there, almost like a ghost I could see through. As the hallway flickered in and out of being, I passed an old chip ceramic sink mounted on the wall. The lines of the sink were faintly drawn into my field of vision. It was a whisper of a dream, translucent, almost transparent. My mind remained awake, but I was, though only barely, dreaming. Eventually, the strangeness of the situation activated my mind enough that it woke me up. Over the next few months, the experience repeated itself in various forms, and not always on my bed. At a crowded book release party, I curled up on a beanbag chair in the middle of the room and slipped into liminal slumber, neither quite awake nor fully asleep. Almost immediately, I began to dream. I watched a cubist-styled man sitting in a chair operate a big industrial machine with a large rotating steampunk apparatus that slapped a bowler hat onto his head, then put glasses on his face, then placed a drink in his hand. From the waist up, he was a framed painting. From the waist down, a human. I knew I was dreaming, but it didn't exactly feel like a dream. I didn't have the sense that I was in the room with the cubist half-man. It was just the man, a flash of his existence, but not exactly a story, and I didn't have a sense of there even being a me present. I also wasn't asleep, totally immersed in a dream world. I maintained awareness of myself napping in the middle of a gathering. I wondered if my dress covered me properly. I could hear my friend Jason, standing a few feet away, describing an art project he was building in Marfa, Texas. Over my years of studying dreams, I had already encountered the idea of hypnagogia, though there are very few detailed studies on the topic. I'd always considered it merely a transitional zone, a place I passed through on my way to REM, Trying to stay in this state was a novel idea, but it soon became the focus of my dreamtime forays. By spring, I had become deeply involved in a liminal dream practice. Hypnagogia is a wild psychedelic ride. If you've ever wished for a powerful 15-minute visionary journey that leaves you totally clear-headed afterwards and produces no hangover, look no further. With practice, I've learned to linger in this state, and now I can usually drop into it at will. I've also learned to last longer in hypnopompia, a delicious, delicate mind state that feels like floating in warm, fluffy clouds. 
I pursued liminal dreaming for the pure experience, but in the process, I discovered a new mode of perception and understanding. I call this mode liminal mind, and it has changed my outlook on life. Beyond providing remarkable journeys through the mind, liminal dreaming can also be harnessed for other purposes, from creativity and problem solving to healing and metacognition. It is my hope that you'll explore liminal dreaming as well, and that this amazing mind state will open new modes of thought and perception for you too. How to listen to this book. I've spent many years absorbed in dreams, and I've had a lot of incredible experiences. In one dream, all emotion drained from me as I died and floated toward a diminishing horizon. In another, fully lucid, I passed through a closed window and felt the glass slide through my body, a vivid, squeaky, pulling sensation. I communed with my dying cat from the other side of the globe. In a Nazi death camp, through a high electric fence wrapped with barbed wire, my former lover sang a hauntingly beautiful song to me in Gaelic, which I do not know the culmination of a storyline that spanned many dream years. I devoted decades to focused work with REM, yet my most consistently astounding dream experiences have come through liminal dreaming. With this book, my primary goal is to both encourage and help you to conduct your own explorations into hypnagogia and hypnopompia, and to learn to look at the world with liminal mind. Using clear language, this book will explain some of the science around dreams. It will explore the concept of liminality in depth, historically, culturally, and philosophically, and it will suggest ways to move through the world with liminal mind. It will provide you with tools and techniques, exercises that help you learn how to access and stay in liminal dream states, guidance on how to establish your own liminal dream practice, and ideas about how to use those practices for creativity, healing, problem solving, and consciousness experimentation. Whether you want to dip into the liminal realm every once in a while, or learn to linger there at length, this book will help you do it. This book is written in a way that invites you to move through it according to your own interests. It's arranged in two parts. Part one explains liminal dreaming, what it is, what science tells us, and how you can learn to do it. Part two explores the broader idea of liminal mind and some practices that support it. The first half of chapter two describes what liminal dreaming is and gives you some beginning exercises. I recommend listening to those for context. From there, though, feel free to meander through the book as you see fit. Of course, it's fine to listen all the way through, as you would with most books. But I've tried to write a book you can move through in whatever way suits you. Maybe one of the chapters in part two looks really interesting and you want to start there. Each is built around a practice or way of seeing or interacting with liminal dreaming. 
exercises sprinkled throughout the book offer you ways of trying out liminal dream practices. You can listen to the chapter for context, but you can also choose any of the exercises presented at the end and try those, regardless of what else you've listened to. The exercises can stand alone. This book is very much about taking the content and making it your own, trying the exercises, developing your own liminal dream practices, taking in whatever information most moves you. I invite you to approach listening to the book in that spirit. Chapter 2 goes into the hows and whys of liminal dreaming. I'll explain how to do it, offering a series of exercises to help you access liminal dream states fully and to learn to stay there for increasingly long periods of time. As with all things, the more you practice, the better you get and the deeper the experience becomes. I'll also outline some of the reasons you might want to experiment with liminal dreaming. You may find, as I have, that the fun of exploring the mind is reason enough to pursue liminal dreaming, but it also has a wide range of practical applications. Chapter 3 delves into some of the science around the stages of sleep and dreams. Using layman's terms, I'll explain how states of consciousness are measured by brainwaves. Liminal dreams, hypnagogia and hypnopompia, have significantly different EEG signatures from other brain states. Most other such states, including REM, display regular, predictable brainwave patterns. Hypnagogia and hypnopompia produce irregular, chaotic rhythms. The subjective experience of liminal dreams is similarly shape-shifting and wild. I'll also discuss chronotypes and circadian rhythms. Sleep and dream patterns relate closely to the fluctuations of energy that regulate the physiological processes of all living things, and these, in turn, are related to the sun. You'll learn how to figure out your own chronotype based on circadian rhythm which determines not only when you work best or prefer to eat and sleep, but also what kinds of dreams are likely to be most vivid and memorable for you. This chapter also contains in-depth descriptions of hypnagogia and hypnopompia, the two phases of liminal dreaming. The chapters in Part 2 all describe practices that build on the core themes of liminal mind, the concept of liminality, the overlay of inner and outer worlds, and imagination as a faculty of perception. The chapters themselves cover a wide range of topics, each centered on a practice or a concept. Chapter 4 expands on the idea of liminal mind introduced in Part 1. I describe what I mean when I talk about practice and introduce the idea of imagination as key to perception, a concept to which I'll return frequently in Part 2. Chapter 5 explores Aristotle's essay on dreams, a study of perception and dream worlds, discusses ideas around mapping, 
and celebrates liminal dream space as uncolonized psychic territory where the tendrils of marketing and the commodification of your attention have yet to reach. Chapter 6 continues to unfold ways in which liminal dreams and imagination serve as vehicles of perception in Jungian practices of active imagination and Sufi understanding of the mundus imaginalis. Chapter 7 addresses some of the scarier things that can result when you open to the unconscious, offering strategies for facing fear and death through liminal dream work. Chapter 8 outlines the ancient Greek practice of dream incubation and describes how to practice it in modern times. Chapter 9 focuses on yoga nidra, or yogic sleep, a practice of withdrawing the senses in order to reach the deeply relaxing state of consciousness between awake and asleep. Chapter 10 outlines some of the basics of lucid dreaming and clarifies the relationship between it and liminal dreaming. Chapter 11 talks about the use of onerogens, any substance, scent, or practice that intensifies dreams, from plants to technology. I conclude with a brief rallying cry, urging you to discover and explore the remarkable liminal dream space in your own mind. Throughout the book, I'll give you exercises to try on your own to develop and direct liminal dreaming. At the end of this book, you'll find the same step-by-step exercises laid out so you can easily access and try any of them whenever you want. It is my hope that you will join me in this foray out to the edges of consciousness so we can all share this remarkable and sometimes bizarre zone of experience in this space that belongs to you alone, free of marketing and also just free, where your mind meanders through wild worlds of its own making, a lot remains possible. Together, we can create a crepuscular culture, we adventurers who linger in the liminal at the edge of the mind.